Michelle, that has sounded weird on my machine. I don't know if anybody else can hear you. She's sounding like a little mouse. That's what I heard. It was cute though. <laughs> How do I sound? Oh, that sounds better. That sound better? Thank you. Yeah, I have to. Better. Does that sound better? Okay, good. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with my microphone, but I always have to do an audio check um, before every Zoom meeting to make sure. So thank you for letting me know. Um, I've already started the recording. And so um, I want to thank everybody for taking the time this morning to go through imports. Um, that's what we're really going to focus on. And I really want this session to be a um, back and forth regarding I want your input basically on um, importing of items and not so much for you know a district that's migrating over because all their data is over here already. Um, they're going in and adding new items through the import option. I'm really specifically wanting some more information regarding districts that are starting new in the redesign. Um, and so we'll get into that here in a little bit. Um, and we try to make some updates on the last release to accommodate those new districts. And in looking into what um, was changed, it's um, going to take some tweaking to get things, I think, to where they need to be. And that's why I need you guys' valuable input in order to figure out what needs to be accomplished for these districts that are starting new in inventory. Um, so we'll kind of start here with the release notes first. What, I, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about what was covered in this last release because a lot of it had to do with the system import option. And, and then from there, um, we're gonna you know, dig into the documentation and I've been making changes. Uh, but like I said, there are some things on this last release that need to still be um, tweaked. So we still have further changes that we're going to need to make in order to get these importing of items um, in order to improve that. Um, so let's start with, with here, here with um, the 1.9 release that was done this last Friday. So um, there were, uh, we did some more testing against the system import option. And we found that um, there were some things that still needed to be fixed. So we fixed those. And just to take you to where that is at, I'm gonna go to home and I'm going to the system option and I'm using the import option, okay? So this will allow them to do mass imports of items. So if there are districts that's tracking um, equipment like Chromebooks or something like that, um, they can go in and create a spreadsheet and import it using this option. So um, in here, this is where they would go in and upload the file and it has to be in a CSV format um, in here. So um, they wanna ensure that that will work. And then selecting the import type. This is the part where they have to decide what they're importing. And so we've got options to import core fields and we have options to import transactions, items, acquisitions, dispositions. Um, so this will provide that list. And um, so just to kind of go through these a little bit here. So anything that says a code, um, Maybe we need to clean these up a little bit more. Um, those are what's going to get loaded underneath the core menu. So asset class, item category is the category code, condition, disposition code, location, organization. Those are all um, fields that are found underneath the core option. So they can be loaded in. Um, so for, and this is, you know, for a new district that's just, you know, starting new on redesign. Um, when it comes to that, they, they have the option of doing that. 
Also, when they are importing item information and that particular code is not already underneath core, it will go ahead and create it. So it will add it underneath the core, but there will not be a description tied to it. So it's really up to the district on how they want to do this. Um, if they have several location codes, maybe it's a good idea for them to import a spreadsheet of their locations because it'll have the descriptions included on the spreadsheet. Whereas if they don't add the locations first and import item records with those locations, it's going to create the locations out here, but without descriptions. They would then have to go in and they could go into locations, extract them from the grid, upload them into Excel, enter in those descriptions and load them back in. But if they feel like that's a lot of extra work, I'm just gonna go ahead and put my locations in first, um, they can do that. And then actually, you know, and when they go in to add the items, then the item will, and import the items, it'll see that the location's already on file and it'll just, you know, add the location to the item. So, um, so it's just, you know, depends on how they want to do that. You know, if they only have four or five asset classes, then they can just add those in manually underneath core asset instead of adding them in through the asset option in imports. It's just totally the preference of the district. Um, but obviously we have transaction type of imports as well. We have item, acquisition, and disposition. These are the transaction um, items. So that's what we're going to get into today. I'm not going to talk about importing the core fields because it's pretty basic. And if I go to our inventory um, documentation here, and I just go down to the asset class codes, I have included template spreadsheets um, for each of the code. So if you know want to go down to locations and pull up that template spreadsheet that's in the correct format, they can use that then to enter in their locations and then they can use that import option to import locations into the core. So, um, so that's, uh, so for all the um, core ones, we've got spreadsheets created. Um, for the transactions, I do have spreadsheets created, but I haven't added them to the documentation yet because of some of the things that we're still um, looking into uh, regarding changes that still need to be made on these transaction imports. And really it's in regards to new districts starting, with districts starting new. Um, for those districts that have migrated over, and like I said, wanna import a bunch of Chromebooks, we have the capabilities to do that now. A lot of that was updated and changed um, on the 1.9 release. It's just, we also added some new options in there that, um, we're wanting your feedback on because we think we need to improve them. So that's what we're going to discuss today. So I really want this an open-ended discussion and not so much training, <clears throat> just to get <clears throat> you guys' feedback um, on some of these new options we implemented. Okay, so with the 1.9 release, um, what we did is we did um, do some changes uh, for disposition transactions. So they really didn't have the capability to mass dispose of um, assets in Classic. Um, I know that some of the ITCs had procedures um, that we had uh, used and we had passed on to other ITCs as well on how to create mass, mass disposition records using, I think it was data tree type of procedures. And I know that we have um, provided those and tickets as well. And those have worked out well. Um, so, because we didn't really just have some type of mass disposition option in Classic. So we do now in um, redesign. And so you can go in and dispose of items, um, but, um, one thing that we still need to correct, and it's going to be on um, 
I believe the next release on 110 or 111. I'm not quite sure which one. Um, but there is an inventory um, uh, JIRA issue out there. And I'm going to pull up where um, the releases are. I don't know if you guys are aware of um, where this information is at. I'm going to go back to, I shouldn't say our releases are JIRA issues. I'm going into JIRA, and this is something that um, we are going to be talking about um, at the end of February. I did schedule a JIRA session regarding customizing um, dashboards in JIRA for you guys and um, in creating a bunch of filters. So we'll get into that at the end of February, but um, it is nice. You can create these filters of just specific topics, whether it's USAS, payroll, inventory, and I've got one of all the inventory issues. And I created like a filter then of the columns that I wanted to see. And in there, then I can go in and select this. And I just want to see um, in progress and to do. So you can kind of see these are still the outstanding inventory issues uh, that we have out there. And I included the fixed version column on my grid so that I can see when these are going to be released. So this is something we're going to cover here in a few weeks and show you guys how to create these same dashboards. But <clears throat> in regard to these disposition transaction imports, um, one thing that is missing on that, and therefore I wouldn't recommend using the disposition imports at this time is that we have um, the disposition code or the disposition method isn't getting loaded in. So that's where we've got this inventory issue 266. And you can see that the developers already started on this and it's going to be released on the next release, which is next Friday. Um, so he'll clean that up to ensure that um, you guys can post disposition um, transactions using the import option without any issues. So that will be cleaned up next week. Um, <clears throat> any questions on that? Okay. Um, we also have, um, if I click on that, And just to kind of give you, you know, a sense of how these <clears throat> issues are written here, these are written by the developers. And so they're going in and kind of explaining what the issue is and what they need to do. And so it, you know, clearly states here that the importer was not setting the disposition code correctly. So we're going to update the importer to set this code correctly, whether adding or updating dispositions. So I think one of the uh, messages that you guys are getting on imports um, is a warning about the disposition code being blank on disposition transactions. It used to be an error, but we changed it to a warning a couple of releases ago in order for you guys to import these uh, items over and these disposition transactions over. They've been like that in classic for years. And so redesign is looking at them and saying, hey, you have a blank disposition code. Well, it's been like that for years in classic. So we're, we're allowing it to happen. But if you wanna go in and clean them up later, you can go into the disposition grid, extract those with a blank <clears throat> disposition method and go in and, imp and you know, add a valid disposition code and then import that back in. Well, uh, we're finding out that um, whether you're doing a new disposition transaction or you're updating an existing disposition transaction, the disposition code was not getting updated. So this um, issue 266 is going to fix that on 110, like I said, which is next week. <clears throat> we're also um, <coughs> Allowing uh, on this one, um, allowing the ability to edit specific fields um, on existing disposition transactions. So 
what we found is that um, Classic allowed when you have a disposition transaction, even if it's, you know, five years old or, or 10 years old, um, it allow you to update the amount received, the authorized by and the, dis and the disposition code. And so we're just ensuring then too on this JIRA issue that you're gonna have the ability to do that as well. So those are just some of the things that are going to get updated um, on the next release regarding dispositions. So, um, so yeah, so we still got some work to do, um, but uh, at this point, I have not changed the documentation to state that you can go in and use the disposition import at this time. So it's still unavailable until we get this resolved um, on these uh, next uh, release. Because yeah, I don't want you guys doing mass dispositions of 100 items and the disposition code doesn't, you know, you're, you're changing the disposition code to be from blank to something else and you're updating it and it's not loading it. You know, what's the point? So we're going to make sure that that gets cleaned up. Um, so at this point, like I said, I'm still leaving this note out here that importing new, and I should change that, and existing dispositions is currently not available. Still need to, to make these few changes and it'll be out there. Um, while we're on here though, and we're looking at the documentation, um, it does have a table for each import explaining the field, the format that it um, must be in, and what the field is about. And so if I'm looking at like the disposition import types, um, you'll see all the different fields that need to be on, uh, that they aren't all required but can be on the uh, spreadsheet. And so um, I'm sure these will be changing and stuff and some won't be required anymore and things like that as we're going through this process. So that's why this is still a draft chapter. Um, but you can see that it explains, you know, this is the actual field name that needs to be entered in the header. So if you're entering in inventory underscore tag, when you're trying to post a disposition transaction, it's not gonna work. It has to be tag. Um, and so it explains all of that in here. So whatever is showing on the field here is the field you should be putting in on the spreadsheet. And like I said, once we get some of these other things tweaked, I will include a template spreadsheet above the table here that you guys can download. It's already got the field names, and the formatting of the fields already in place. So it's just a matter of going in and entering in the information. Um, so in here, again, it explains like the tag number um, and how long it should be, things like that, the date format and what it accepts. And so um, the disposition code, um, it's going to use the ones, uh, you wanna enter in the ones that are already under core but if you have a new one that you want to put in here and it's not in core already, it will be added to core. So it'll be, you know, obviously on the disposition transaction. And then that new disposition code will be included in core as well. The only thing that it doesn't include, like I said before, is a description. So, you know, the district would have to go in and modify that new disposition um, code and put in the correct description for it. So it, it works kind of similar to what the EIS import option in Classic did. And so some of these, um, one thing that I had said earlier was um, on that particular JIRA issue is this authorized by amount received and error adjustment. Um, these will no longer be required fields. Um, so right now that's the way they're working. Well, these are optional. Um, so the amount received, you don't have to put in an amount if you didn't receive anything for it. So, um, so we will be updating these um, and removing the required fields from that. So that again will be on that uh, JIRA issue that should go out next week. Okay, so going back to the 1.9 release here. 
um, acquisitions. Um, I will talk about acquisitions here in a little bit. I'm going to skip down to items because we made a lot of changes to the item uh, option in the system import. So one thing that we noticed was that um, capitalized assets that you're importing in, it wasn't flagging those. When you look at an item um, through the item option, it's got that little box up at the top and it's checkmarked if it's capitalized. Um, when you're, so when you're creating them manually, it's not an issue, but when you're importing them, it wasn't marking them as capitalized. So we have fixed that on this last release. Um, also, um, we've added a couple new I options, allowing a prior year checkbox and create acquisition record. I'm going to talk about these in great length here in a little bit. These are the ones where I'm really wanting feedback from you guys regarding that. Um, some of the other fixes that we did is the depreciation method field is no longer case sensitive. So if you entered in a lowercase s, instead of an uppercase, um, it wasn't marking it. So we fixed that. So whether it's lower or upper, it's going to load it in. The organization codes, fund and functions will be created if they don't exist already underneath core. So what we were finding is that um, it was um, not allowing, if it wasn't already in core, it wasn't allowing you to, um, import items with a different organization funded function. So we've changed that now so that if you do have a new uh, fund code that you're using on the import and it isn't out there in core already, it'll now allow you to import the item and it will also add that new fund underneath core. So, and functions and organization codes are the same. Um, also, we still we had some more case sensitivity on some of these, so we've cleaned those up as well regarding category, location, and organization. Uh, the least type fields uh, are correctly um, being added now, um, so those were not getting imported incorrectly. And um, exporting the CSV file from the item grid uh, will now have all the correct field headers. So, you know, if you go in and you want to update um, the beginning depreciation date um, because it was blank or invalid uh, when it imported in, you can go in, extract that out of the items grid, go in and it's got the proper heading, go in and make the changes and add those valid beginning depreciation dates and go back in and import it and update the records. Um, so we did do some uh, changes to some of those field headers. Um, the beginning depreciation date one wasn't one of them, but um, secondary tag, organization code and organizational unit, uh, we had to fix the heading formats on that. So uh, those are good to go as well. So basically in a nutshell, when it comes to items, if you're migrated over, um, or you're starting in classic and you're entering in items for the current year, you're good. Um, you can go in and mass add items. So what we were running up against, and this is where I'm going back to these two options. So I'm going to pull those up here on the screen so you can see what I'm talking about. I'm going into items. There is an allow prior year option and a create acquisition record. So, you know, we've been focused on, you know, the challenges of migrating um, classic districts over. And so, um, you know, trying to finalize some of these uh, system import options, um, we're trying to better handle it for districts that are starting new in redesign. So, you know, we're we're still working out kinks with migrating uh, classic. You know, we're still getting tickets regarding questions on balancing issues. That's going to happen because we don't know what each district's data is like in classic. So we're going to have to keep working on those and getting those fixed as we go. And I appreciate your patience on that. 
Um, but you know, for those that have successfully migrated, and like I said, they have a bunch of Chromebooks that they want to add in for the current year, um, they can through this option. They can import. Um, and so I'm going to show you that first, and then I'm going to bring you into these two options for new uh, districts. Um, and we'll talk about those. So if I'm just doing, like I said, a typical Chromebooks import where I've created a spreadsheet, and I'm going to pull one of them up here. So here is a typical items import spreadsheet. And so what I've done here, and like I said, I'm going to be adding this one to the documentation. So you guys have this, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, and uh, these are the required fields and I've also formatted them. I've got a template one here too. I don't think I have that one open, um, but basically it's the same thing as this, but it just doesn't have any data in it. Um, but I've made sure that the format of each column is correct. So, you know, when you click on them, you'll see, like, instead of general, the inventory tag is a text format because of those leading zeros <clears throat> that can be in the tag number. So, you know, unfortunately, um, and, and it's, <clears throat> these are all going to be in Excel format too. So that way these stay put. Um, if you go in and create this spreadsheet of all these Chromebooks in Excel, in the Excel format, and then you're ready to import them in, you're going to be using, saving this as a CSV format so that then you can upload it in. So if I realized um, that I made a mistake, I missed something, um, I need to, you know, change things, stuff like that, let's say my whole import file got rejected because um, the inventory tags weren't recognizable. And so what's nice is I can go back to that original Excel spreadsheet, make the changes to that, save it as a CSV file again, and try another import. So I, I would always recommend that the districts work out of the Excel format first, this, the Excel spreadsheet. And then from there, once they make the changes, save it as a CSV file and then proceed with the import. And so, like I said, I, I've uh, uh, created all these different formats in here. Um, so, you know, some of these are going to be number format because it's a dollar amount. And um, so, as you can see, there's a lot of um, empty columns. You can get rid of those. Um, you have to only be concerned about the required ones, and those are listed in the documentation as to which ones are required. Um, but, you know, if you're not using the second inventory tag um, and stuff like that, um, you can get rid of those and just make your, because when I start scrolling here, you're going to see there's a lot of fields in the item record. Um, so it's going to go out there. And you know, I'm providing every single field. So I've got all the lease stuff, all the user defined fields way at the end here. So if these aren't necessary, you can get rid of them. So you can see your the spreadsheet a little bit better. Um, but um, yeah, so that's kind of you know how this is looking. So I'm just putting in what I, I want. So if I don't use the organization units, I'm not going to worry about this one. Um, the status I can leave blank because it will default to active. Um, so we don't have to worry about filling in an A or anything there. So I basically got, you know, the stuff that I'm seeing in items in, in the items window. My asset class, fund and function, you notice these are all text format because of the leading zeros that could take place. Um, acquisition information, the date, and um, you know, and my acquisition date here is in, um, if, if the year is open, then it's going to allow me to go in and create those items for that year. In my inventory instance, it's in fiscal year 20. So my acquisition date is in fiscal year 20. And so I've got my original cost here. I'm just going to scroll over. Um, I've got my depreciation information. So my beginning depreciation date is going to be the same as my acquisition date. So I've just got the same, I can basically copy and paste that in here. Um, my life 
So these are all five years and my depreciation methods, all straight line. And obviously I don't have a life to date right now because these are new items. So once these items are added, close the year, then that depreciation will start being tracked. Um, so this is kind of like, you know, what the standard format and then, you know, the ability to go in and add whatever you need. Um, you can also extract, so this is for new items. You can also go in and extract existing items from the items grid um, to make any changes to those existing items. Um, and so if, like I said, if you're going in and your location codes pulled over, they migrated over, but you received a warning because they were um, partial codes, like maybe the location category was missing or the location number was missing. And so they've probably been like that for years in classic. And so if that is something that the district wants to eventually clean up and redesign, they can by going out there and extracting them out. <clears throat> and that's one other thing I wanna make mention of, I'm gonna close out of this quick. And I'm going to go into the items grid. And one thing that um, is going to be changed sooner rather than later, because I asked about this, um, is this location code. Right now, it's not showing both the category and the number on the grid. If I view the item, I can clearly see it. So this is going to get updated sooner rather than later because I know that you will run into the issue where you're trying to find those partial codes. And right now they all look like partial to me. Um, so um, this needs to be fixed so you can see the complete code so that you can filter on those blank ones. I mean, I could pull the whole thing into an Excel spreadsheet right now and resort it to find the partial ones and get rid of all the others, but there could be thousands of items on here, right? So. Um, so yeah, so filtering is gonna help with that. And so um, this is another JIRA issue. And I think I have, I might even have that marked on here. Look. Maybe I don't. But yeah, it is. Um, an issue that I think we need to address sooner rather than later. So that if districts want to clean up their location codes, I know that's like not number one on their list because like I said, they've been out there like that probably for years. Um, but if they want to, they can um, once we kind of get this cleaned up a little bit on the grid. Um, but you know, if it is something where um, they want to take care of it, I mean, they can now, they can just, Ex, you know, extract um, from the grid, like I said, resort the locations and they're gonna see those blank ones right away because they're probably gonna be at the top of the spreadsheet, get rid of everything, you know, that they don't wanna change. And then they can go in and update the those, those, those locations and import them back in. And so um, if that's something, and I think I might even have, an example of like what that spreadsheet could look like. I'm gonna do location import. Oh, no, that's not the right one, sorry. And valid locations, there we go. And so here were some that, it had the location number and um, went and they received warnings in the when they did the import on the inventory results file that they were partial codes. Well, they, they still came over, the items still came over, but um, they want to clean this up now. So you can, like I said, extract from the items grid, pull these in. And what they can do then is they can go in and remove whatever columns as long as, and you'll notice on when you're extracting existing transactions, there is going to be this column called ID. 
And so you leave that alone. So you don't mess with that. That's looking at the item uh, information. It's, it's relative to that specific item. So we just leave that go. Um, and basically, if I have so much on my grid and I don't want to accidentally, you know, update a column that I don't intend to update, um, I can get rid of those columns and just focus on the columns I want to change. And so in here, I'm changing the location number <clears throat> from blank to what it should be. So basically, I have my standard record ID column, my ID column that only gets populated when I'm extracting existing data. Um, the inventory tag, um, I don't know if that's really required because I have the ID, but doesn't hurt to leave it on here. Um, the location category and the location number. So basically I save this then as a CSV file. And then what I'm gonna use is I'm gonna to go to system, import. And I would upload that file. And I would make sure that my item import um, is the item or my import type is the item record. And you'll notice when you select these, the options down here are gonna change based on the import type. And in this particular one, I want to update the records. These aren't new ones. These are existing ones that had a partial location. So I've fixed those in my spreadsheet, and now I want to update those. So I want to make sure that the update records is checked. The create transfers, I don't really care about that because we're talking about locations. If this was a missing fund or function or asset class, that migrated over so you have maybe a capitalized asset that doesn't have a fund um, then i definitely if i extract that out enter in the correct fund number and import it back in i would want create transfers to be checked so that not only does it put the fund on the item but it also creates a transfer transaction saying for this particular capitalized asset I'm changing it from blank to this particular fund number. Um, and we had a similar option in Classic 2 under the EISIX program. There was an EIS IMP, the EIS import, and you could do that as well. So that's what that's all about. So updating records is pretty straightforward. I'm updating existing items. So if these are brand new Chromebooks that I'm just putting in, this would be unchecked. I have a question here. If you export from the grid in inventory, will the column headers be correct um, for an import? Yes. So that's the stuff that we, we tweaked some of that on version 1.9, and we have been tweaking those. So when it comes to M, um, exporting and updating existing items, um, when you pull it into Excel, it will absolutely be in the correct format. If it isn't, create a ticket and we'll look into it. But um, I know that they've looked those over. Um, so those should be um, out there. Those should be in the correct format. OK. And I know, you know, some of those, when I think about those common warning messages you guys are getting on the imports, like the location, the one we just talked about, um, the depreciation method, which we still need to, to fix. Um, what was another one? You know, missing fund function asset classes. Those are warnings now. I know there was another pop. Oh, the beginning depreciation dates. I think that was the big one too. Um, so, you know, those are things now um, that can be cleaned up, you know, the locations, the beginning depreciation dates um, on the items. Um, so if those are things where they came over as warnings and the district wants to clean them up, if they want to clean them up, up now, they can, um, or they can clean them up whenever they have time. So, um, like I said, I think they all probably are in the agreement. Uh, it's been that way for a long time. Um, yeah, I always meant to clean it up in classic and I never did, but um, 
they have the option to do that and redesign too, if they need to. Okay, I'm gonna go back to my outline here. All right, so I want to talk about, so like I said, for new district, for um, existing migrating districts, some of the stuff's in, in, is available for them to use now. Um, and like I said, I will update the inventory documentation for the item import <clears throat> to uh, create a template here um, for new ones. And, you know, and like um, Andrew asked, for existing items that are already out there that migrated over and they want to clean up some of that, they can pull it from uh, using the export option. It'll have the correct headers. They can make those changes and they can import it back in using that update option. So those capabilities are out there now. What we are trying to improve and work on here are new districts. So this is where I'm going to start asking you guys some questions here. And I want some feedback on what you guys feel about this, or if we need to discuss this maybe further with districts. Um, what feedback we were already getting from um, ITCs is that my district's data is a mess in Classic, and they don't want to migrate over but they want to um, pull some of those items from classic and create a new uh, you know, redesign instance and load those in. Well, let's think about that for a minute because I'm thinking, okay, they're probably talking about you know, capitalized assets and um, buildings land, vehicles, some of those you know, high dollar items that they have that they wanna put in their new inventory instance, but you're talking about items that span multiple years. So your land could be 50 years old. You, um, you know, the buildings could be several years old. And so how are we going to get that information in and import it into redesign? And how should it be entered in? Um, so for those of you that weren't familiar with Classic and how we did that, because a lot of you are probably asking, well, how'd you guys do it in Classic? Um, well, when it came to like new inventory, um, the district built a new building, you know, or the campus, they have several buildings and they just want to totally um, forget about their old inventory and just do a brand new inventory. They got they had an appraisal company come in and you know make tons of updates. So they want to just basically scrap what they have and start new. We had a procedure, a long checklist, basically showing them how to go in and load that stuff and load all of those, you know, the appraisal companies coming in and loading a bunch of assets that are years old um, because, you know, they're, they're still active valid assets for the district. So if my um, classic files are in fiscal year 21 right now and I'm scrapping the whole thing and starting over, how am I gonna get all of those items for multiple years on the system? So we use that loading a new inventory document um, to do that. And that had like workarounds and how to basically, you know, get the system to load all that stuff without making them all acquisitions for this current year. Um, and so that's the part, the trouble we were running into with redesign is because you've got a new district starting on here. They're not going to want cre to create fiscal years for 1950, when they acquired the land, um, they are wanting to somehow load that information in, um, you know, those specific ones that they want to bring over from classic and load them in with those correct years. So we came up, and I'm gonna go back into the import option here, with these, um, options 
in on, and we put these on 1.9, but we are still wanting to tweak these based off of um, some of the things that um, we found this week. So this allow prior year is basically allowing them to add those specific items in with those acquisition dates for that year. But one thing that we still need to look into is there is, is the capitalized assets. I'm concerned about their beginning balance amounts and how are those being tracked? And so that needs to be looked into further. Um, but I guess before we really work on this further, I want to ask you guys, how, mm -hmm. how do you want this to be um, tracked, you know, for these new districts? Do you have districts that are like, I want to be able to put in, you know, some of my, you know, information and I don't want my building that I, you know, acquire 10 years ago to go in as an acquisition in fiscal year 22. Um, hey, does Michelle. that make sense what I'm asking? Yeah. Hey, Michelle, yes. this is, this is Vicki. How are you? Good. How are you doing, Vicki? Good. So my thought process on that from a district standpoint is that could you make it to where you somebody should have their ending balance on their capital assets like their land and their buildings they should have their ending balance from fiscal year 21 and then if they create that new record if they want to start over because i i'm one of those people with neoman that's going to start over so um could you make it to where that beginning balance is you can modify it to put in the ending balance of the previous year that was one of the things that we talked about is, you know, can we somehow make this um, capability of, you know, actually modifying that beginning balance field. Modifying um, the balance, the years, you know, all of those things that, um, you know, would be a long-term item, the building, the land, all of that, you should, um, I think it would be advantageous if maybe those items could be modifiable so that they can transfer the stuff over and then somehow lock it down so that it can't be modified anymore. You know, like once, once everything is in balance. Gotcha. That's my thought process on it. Thank you. No, that was one thing that we discussed actually is the ability to go in, you know, and, and like you said, there's gotta be some type of security measures with that. You know, once those are locked in, you know, they can't go back in and make changes to those beginning balances. Who will have the ability to do that? Um, you know, we're right now updating um, the roles in inventory. So who's going to have um, the ability to do that and just stuff like that. So um, and anyone else with any um, thoughts on, I mean, is, is this like a real problem here when I'm talking about, or am I just making this up in my head? Um, are they going to want for an, a new district, you know, that's, going is going to be new in redesign are they going to be wanting to load these assets that they've acquired over several years yes yeah yes. exactly hey hey michelle this is andrew from woco um i know deb meyer from has put some things in for you um i just want to add that i, I think most of our districts are in the same position uh maybe as what vicky said uh that the ones that want to start new, but we do have one that two treasurers ago used EIS. So fiscal year 2000, and then this next treasurer from 2000 till recently didn't use it, but now the new one wants to use it again. So, and I'm new to this whole uh, inventory. I didn't really use EIS. But whatever solution, I guess I'm hoping that we could make it work for somebody in that situation as well. Either somebody that literally never used it and was using a spreadsheet or, you know, it's they can't take the balance from last year 
from EIS because the last balance that was in EIS is from fiscal year 2000. So yes. that, you know, I don't know if the solution will be able to handle that or not, if any of that made sense. Andrew, I, I yeah. was I, I was kind of saying like the balance from whatever system that you use. Oh, okay. okay. Whether it's EIS or your own spreadsheet, you know, whatever system that you use, take the balance that audit has audited and is okay with and start there. That's okay. kind of what I was meaning. Okay, yeah. Um, like I said, I'm kind of I'm kind of new to this. I just wanted to point out, like throw out there, and I don't know how many other ITCs have that, but we're gonna have at least one, maybe two, that are like, you know, that the EIS data is so old and so bad that it's not even just cleanup; it's it's totally unusable, you know. So, Michelle, yes, and is there any way that we can add like a little field, like for a note? Like this was from, uh, you know, 2021 or, and have that embedded in there as a little note field underneath it. I think the, the biggest issue here, Marge, is let's say, um, let me use an example here. Let's say I've got, you know, I have my old EIS system, you know, it, it was a mess, but I want to pull over my buildings. And I, I want to put those in and import those into a new instance in inventory. And I put in, and let's say, you know, all these buildings were, you know, acquired or completed or whatever um, 10 years ago. But I'm in fiscal year 22 right now. So if I create a spreadsheet and I put in acquisition dates from those periods, you know, and maybe I have several different ones. Um, so I'm loading in those five buildings with five different dates from within the last 10 years. If I go in and put in that date, selecting allow prior year, it will go in right now and create the item information and the related acquisitions with those dates from those years. If I go in and run, and these are all capitalized assets, if after I import those in and I run a gap report, like the changes in fixed assets, and I look at the beginning balance, it's going to be zero. That's the problem that we have right now um, is because it's not recognizing those and putting those in. Um, and so that's what we need to work on to get that to where we either, we need to find a way for them to put those beginning balances in. We have those, and if I go to items, I don't think I have it pulled up on my grid right now, but underneath more, this has always been, the beginning balance has always been a hidden field in classic. Like district people could not see the beginning balance except for on reports, but ITC staff people could see it in data tree. They couldn't even go in and see it in the classic programs. Um, let's see here. Okay. Maybe it's not on the grid. Maybe it's when I view one, sorry. There it is, yeah, that's something that we probably need to change. Um, but you'll see there the beginning balance is showing. And so when you're migrating from classic, that gets put into place because obviously when you're doing the migrations, you're balancing you know, your gap reports too to make sure you know, um, that all of that information is balanced. But when, um, and when you're adding new items through the inventory import in here, um, obviously the beginning balance won't get set until you close the year, then it will set the beginning balance. But our concern was going in and using this import for prior year tags and you know, entering that information in. And right now it's not recognizing those beginning balances and how do we get that in there? Do we have to somehow calculate it or do we have the person that's importing it at the beginning amount? 
So, um, and I know Vicki said, you know, if there's a way to add that information in, and it's not just like the um, <clears throat> beginning balance, which is coming from the original cost, okay? It's not just that. It's also the depreciation, like the, the uh, EIS 104 in Classic right now, which is now the scheduled change in depreciation. How is that going to get tracked as well when you're allowing prior year items to be added in? And um, so how is that, you know, when you're running the 104 in Classic, there's that beginning depreciation amount. So that's based off of, you know, the prior years ending depreciation. Um, and so how do we get that stuff in there? Does that, does that help Marge? Okay, anyone else with any thoughts about, you know, these districts starting new and how to get prior year items imported. Okay. Well, this is like food for thought right now. And that's what we're looking into. And we're wanting to get this done soon. Um, so that, you know, people have the ability to go in and add this information in, you know, they're going to be, you know, like I think Andrew said, where they're totally scrapping it and they're not even, you know, they're just wanting to go in and add these items, even though they've been tracking it on a spreadsheet for several years and they're wanting to put that information in here from, you know, 1990, you know, um, but it's still a capitalized asset, active asset. How are we going to get in there and make sure that it's reflected correctly on the gap reports? You know, is what we're we're working on right now. And so the you know the beginning balance is one of those fields that we need to look into and see. But I'm on the right track with you guys that you know. I obviously they want to put the stuff in here from prior years, so. When they do, they want to use those dates from those prior years. They don't want to be putting it in from a building that they did 10 years ago and forced to put in an acquisition date of this year. It's not when it happened. It happened 10 years ago. So how do we get that on there? You know, so that's kind of where we're at right now with this. So with that being said, yeah, and I know you guys have, Kelly said too, I have districts that want to overhaul their inventory system. Yep, it totally, we're gonna get a lot of that. So, you know, you've got these districts that, you know, have kept up on inventory um, in classic and they're migrating over just fine, but you've also got these districts that been using a spreadsheet or never used classic um, and they wanna be able to get this information in here, so. If you guys, you know, think about this for a while and have, you know, thoughts about, you know, on how you're thinking this should be tracked, or if you've got examples of districts, send me an email. Um, you know, I just appreciate any feedback. I want to make sure that we're all on the same page uh, when we're talking about this. So with that being said, you know, we go back to these new options we added. So this allow prior year and um, this create acquisition record were two new options we added that right now are not working the way we want them to. Um, and I have noted that in the documentation that, um, let's go back up to the top here where I've got all these fields and read that, um, at this point, these aren't to be used until we look into this whole beginning balance. Um, you know, I'm just more I'm concerned about these capitalized assets, you know, and getting things recorded correctly. Um, so um, holding off on, you know, these new districts um, and being able to, you know, 
add this information in from several years on here that allow prior year should not be used. Now the other one, and this is where I want your feedback as well, is this create acquisition record. So, and you'll notice when I'm in here, it is checkmarked by default and it should be because when I'm going in and creating a new item, um, like those Chromebooks for this current year, um, it's going to create an acquisition record at the same time. It did that in Classic. When you add one manually, it creates the acquisition record automatically. And so that's why we have it checked by default because it should always create the acquisition record. Questions we were getting from people was, okay, um, I'm starting, this is again, a new district. I'm starting new and I have got an item that's five years old that I have 15 acquisition records against. Okay, that make up the amount of that one item. Those acquisition records are different dates throughout those five years. How do we handle if they want those 15 acquisition records to be imported in here, they don't wanna just lump them all together into one acquisition record and just add that one. They want them separate like they were in classic or however they're tracking. Um, we came up with this create acquisition record option here where if left unchecked, it will create the item, but not an acquisition. Then they could import those acquisitions on a separate spreadsheet for that item and use the acquisition option to allow prior year acquisitions and import those in. Is that necessary, I guess? You know, I, or do we, I mean, we're, the system is more flexible. Is this too flexible? Is this where, and you know, having, you know, some of you as, you know, former treasurers is great. Cause I, you know, would like to get your feedback on this. Um, are, are we making this a little too flexible? Should they just have the ability? Yeah, I know that you had multiple acquisitions against that item for multiple years that make up the original cost amount of $1,000. But if you're going to put that item in here, do we allow them to allow them to put all those acquisitions or do we say, you know, you're going to import the item, you're going to import that one acquisition for the thousand dollars, and that's it. I'm going to pick on Vicki. Don't pick on me. Um, somebody I just saw in that chat was talking about gap. So it's it's going to be it's going to be tough. Um, it's it's really going to be tough, and I think it's it's gonna all depend on what people are going to want to import in here. Like my former district, I had all of those Chromebooks and all of those things for $200, $250, $350. I had all of that. Um, it created a nightmare for me. So I think it's going to, a lot of it is going to depend on what that treasure wants to be held accountable for and how much modification that they're going to want to make uh -huh. because um if they are on gap it's going to matter it's going to it's going to matter for them and yes and that's kind of what i'm talking about is you know when i'm talking about this stuff it's the gap the people that have their gap um track you know tracked on the system if they're not tracking gap then it's really not um, you know, a big deal in here, but for those that, you know, are, that's, that's the part I'm concerned about is, you know, just trying to make sure, and, you know, and 
you know, do they want to be specific here and say, you know, I want to show all the acquisitions that I've done throughout the last five years for this item. I want to record those in here. Um, I, so I would. That was my intention at my former district mm -hmm. was to in, in, you know, I'm just being honest on that, on my former district, that was my whole intention was to get a beautiful, clean start, but still have all of the data accurate so that I wasn't fighting with auditors over a hundred dollars here, $200 here, that I had a perfect new database that I could start from, but also incorporated where items were at in that whole process of depreciation, realizing it was going to take a whole lot of work to get me there, but I was, I was willing to do that because that's what I wanted. See, and the way that it worked in classic is, you know, in, in an example where they're scrapping their old inventory. And so they've got those items that have multiple acquisitions against them, but they're scrapping that, but they still want that item on the new one. When it comes over from the spreadsheet, it's not going to include all those acquisition transactions. Right. You know, the spreadsheet's going to load into Classic saying, you know, your item was $1,000, even though you may have had 10 acquisitions each for $100 to make up that 1000 in your old Classic data. And your new Classic data, when you do the new import, it's just going to have the one item and the one acquisition for $1,000. So, and that was something, I mean, that's it's been that way you know, forever. And so, you know, this was where we have this flexibility in this system, you know, do, do we want to allow, you know, them to do that? And so I think the part that we, like I said, need to look into is the whole gap part of it here um, and how this is going to get calculated correctly for these districts that want to start new and redesign that are in gap. So, so, so um, just thinking, just thinking outside the box, and I could be way off base um, because of how you know I didn't I didn't use the EIS system at my other district. Um, so, if someone had their district reevaluated and imported all of those. I don't know how those tapes look like when they're revaluated. Like, does that company take the old information and update it on their, on their particular tape or file or however, you know, whatever they use so that the land and the building, you know, let's just use land and buildings or whatever. Um, do they take that and then just update it with current values? But does all of that information pull in, like if they use the same valuation company? You know what I'm saying? Uh, all right. So, even use a Chromebook. Let, let's use a let's use a Chromebook. So they had their sure. they had their district valuated five years ago, and they had a hundred Chromebooks on there for two hundred fifty dollars a piece, totaling whatever dollar amount, and you have it reevaluated now, they have that on their old file, all of those Chromebooks. So when they update that, wouldn't the, the, you know, and I know Chromebooks are no good after five years, but whatever, wouldn't those depreciation values automatically be included on that tape? They should be. Yes. I mean, just from the tapes that I have seen, you know, um, this, you know, the spreadsheets and stuff, um, they have those values loaded in there on the spreadsheet um, when they do that appraisal, and then those amounts get loaded in to the system. So maybe yeah. that's a, maybe that's a good suggestion that if you want to start new, you need to get your your district reevaluated and start there. Because if not, it's going to be nearly impossible to have 10, tr 10 transactions against a thousand dollar line item. Somebody's going to be there forever trying to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Correct. That's a good point. Who's going to want to do that? I wouldn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's the thing. I mean, I think it really just depends on what they are currently using right now. You know, if um, they're using some type of spreadsheet and they are keeping that stuff up to date, you know, and they do have 
an appraisal firm, you know, updating things and, you know, they, you know, some of them are, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but some of them are contracting with appraisal companies to keep type of, that type of stuff up to date. So if they yes. do, if they, they do, they should then, be. Gotcha. Um, then they could take that information and, you know, load that in here. I just don't know what, what all they want to load, you know? I mean, do they want that to have those, you know, they may have, you know, like I said, several acquisitions that make that amount up. Do they want to record all those acquisitions against that item? Or do they just want to just load it in and say, this is where I'm at right now. And, you know, this is my current, you know, my current values for this item. And I'm just going to add an item with one acquisition and put it in here with my, you know, current life to date depreciation too, you know, and, and load that stuff in. I just don't know how, how far we go with the flexibility. Yeah. That's a, that's a tough one, Michelle, because everybody's going to be across the board on that. I know. I know. Everybody, yeah. Everybody's going to be across the board on that because some people are, you know, I contracted with a company. So every year I had to turn in my additions, deletions, changes, um, all of that. And then they sent me a new report every year. Um, but that's going to be a tough one because everybody's going to be across the board on that. Michelle, it's been a while since I've imported a, a district into Classic, but if I remember correctly, when we got a new file from an appraisal company, it didn't have multiple acquisition records per item. It only had one. Um, and I may be missing something or I may have missed something and didn't hear it, but if we got a file from an appraisal company, is it possible to load that as is, or does it have to be tweaked and customized into these layouts in order to import? Oh, I mean, and that's the thing. If it, it, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, what, um, when we, the thing is, is when you get that new appraisal and they're starting new in here and they have all of those different dates from prior years, I guess, you know, we just want to know, is it, you know, right now classic, you know, allowed them to import those in with just, you know, that, and it creates a transaction for that one, one transaction per item, basically. And so if that's how you want it to behave in here, um, when you go under items, oops, I'm sorry, I meant to be, stay in the import. When you, you know, use this item option and you allow prior year to add those in, um, it's and you have the create acquisition record check marked. It's going to act like it did in in well, kind of like it did in classic, but it's going to allow you see what we did in classic is for new inventory we had like a we they imported it in, but all of the acquisition information was had to be in a a date in the current year and so in that procedure we had it then allowed us through data trave to tweak those dates so that the acquisition date became the items acquisition date which was the true acquisition date of like five ten years ago and so um you know, we got that all in place and also put it in to where we did all of this in the prior, the year before they want to be on inventory in EIS so that when we ran the gap, the EIS gap program, it's then set those beginning balances at that time and made everything look like it's been in there for several years. So that's what we're trying, I think, to accomplish in here 
is right now by allowing prior years and allowing to create acquisition records, if we just want it one acquisition record per one item, just like it was in classic, then both of those would be selected. It would go out there and create all of those items with that date from several years ago and the acquisition with that same date from several years ago. But the problem we're running into right now that we noticed is that the beginning balances are not getting set for those districts that are on gap. So that's what we need to look into. But we also had people saying, well, if I don't check mark the create acquisition record because I want to show all of those acquisitions that made up that amount, they could uncheck this. It will go out there still and create the item with that prior year date. Then they could go in and create a separate spreadsheet of those acquisitions and go into um, select the acquisition option um, and make sure that, you know, allow prior years checked and it would create all of those acquisitions. Obviously, the total dollar amount of all those acquisitions for that, you know, has to match the original cost for that item or else, it, you know, it's not going to work. But again, beginning balances. I, you know, I'm just like, what's happening with those capitalized assets with beginning balances? That's what we need to look into still. Does that make sense, Mary? Yes. Okay. So Deb had a comment here, if they're not in gap, so the acquisition in the current year isn't a big deal. If they import all their assets by spreadsheet and have an acquisition date, of a prior year, that's the date that's going to come in correct, right? So if they're not on gap, this really isn't an issue. But if they're on gap, that's what I'm concerned about, you know, um, and that's what we need to look into. So that's why in the documentation, you know, I, maybe I need to stress this a little bit better and say, please do not use this option if you're on gap or something like that um, at this time until we you know, get this figured out, which, you know, our, I was with the developer yesterday talking about it, and um, he's aware that this is something we need to get done sooner rather than later. So, um, so that's kind of, I wanted to explain these two new options, you know, that are available in the import, but we're not done with them yet, is basically what I wanted to say to you guys. So I hope that makes sense. I didn't confuse you all the more. And if you're not sure, look it up in the documentation because it will tell you. <laughs> okay. That, um, you know, I, I know that I kind of, you know, went through before we got into these two prompts, we talked about, you know, just loading, you know, their they're migrated over or they're new or they're not on gap, whatever, and they're in the current year and they want to add items for the current year. It's not an issue. Um, they can go in and like I said, I am going to include like templates out here where they can go in and um, import those new items in the current year and it will create the items and the acquisition against that item um, automatically. And all of that's updated. And like I said, the, the version 1.9 made some corrections to get that done. So, you know, I am going to be going into the documentation here and just tweaking that a little bit to explain that. But, you know, when it comes to items in the open period, it's not a problem. You can go in and mass enter those Chromebooks, um, just like, you know, that spreadsheet I showed you. Um, and like I said, too, when it comes to those common import errors that you were getting about warnings. We changed a lot of those from fatals to warnings a couple of releases ago. When it comes to missing fund functions, missing um, or invalid locations, um, missing or invalid depreciation uh, beginning dates, those are still all imported as is, 
You don't have to fix them in classic ahead of time. They will import over as is, but then you can go into the items grid and extract what you need out of there. Make those changes in Excel and use that extracted um, Excel file because the, the header columns are correct. Make those changes. And like I said, if you want to filter that down, like my example here, and get rid of those columns that, you know, you don't want to accidentally overwrite something. Let's say, you know, you had um, an item category on here and you went in and accidentally hit your space bar or something. You were thinking you were in the location number, but you were really in the item category and you retype something. And then you go and import this in, it's going to overwrite whatever is currently in this item category column. It's going to overwrite that with the new value. So if you're like, just don't want to have to worry about accidentally updating something I shouldn't have, um, get rid of those columns on this spreadsheet and just include, you know, um, the columns that you want to change. So if there's um, maybe you didn't, they didn't have serial numbers or model numbers. Um, on the spreadsheet for some reason, and they want to go in and update, you know, on these items, they want to go in and update those at a later time, they can. They would just go in and filter those on the items grid, extract it out, you know, in Excel, enter in those serial model numbers, and then go in to the import option. And they're always going to use, go back in there, they're going to be using the update records when they want to update existing records. So if they're doing brand new load of Chromebooks, they're going to make sure that that is unchecked. So um, that those um, are, you know, new items that you're entering in. Okay. Do you guys feel that, you know, based on, you know, I know that a lot of this information, the documentation, you know, is just kind of like a recap of all the different options. Do you feel like we need to have something in the appendix or a video or something um, along like general procedures or something where we need to kind of like document how to do um, an import, you know, step one, you know, if you're going to have new items, use the inventory template, you know, enter in your information, step two, go into system import and update this um, and, you know, upload your spreadsheet, you know, step three, review the items that you just imported to make sure that everything's correct. Um, do you feel like we need to have like a, either a, a recording or like I, what I've done is I've gone in and did just some general procedures of the transaction menu. So this is when it comes to like doing manual transactions in the transaction menu with just like these are the steps. And so um, I can also do one for imports and just do like steps one through five. So this is how they complete an import. Michelle? Yes. This is Vicki again. I'm all for checklists. You know that. So I'm just going to throw that out there. Um, I operate off of checklists. So on a personal note, yes, I would like to have a checklist. I think most districts do. You know, that's how they get through their day is with checklists. More documentation is always good. I, I do believe that, Nancy, so that is true. Oh, a question about um, where are the templates? Yes, um, I did say that earlier, but that's all right. I know you um, said that you came in late, but what I did is <clears throat> go back. I And I haven't done it yet for um, the inventory or for the items one yet. But um, what I'm going to do is add, I'll show you down here because I did it for the core ones because those were easy. Um, we went in and we created template spreadsheets 
um, for each of the core imports. And I'm going to provide the same for items and acquisitions. Um, not dispositions yet, because we do have that bug with the disposition code not being loaded in correctly yet. So I didn't want to do that yet until um, that's been fixed, which will be on the next release. Um, but yes, we are going to definitely include template um, spreadsheets underneath acquisitions and um, inventory and, and items as well. Um, the, the acquisition imports, um, you know, if you've got an item that already exists and you've got additional acquisition um, that you want to load in instead of adding them in manually through the acquisition option, um, you can definitely do that. So it is going to go out there and I have that noted, sorry for all the scrolling, that when you're importing acquisitions, um, like I said, I'm gonna change this here. Um, the item record must exist um, before an additional acquisition record can be created. That just is common sense. If you know the item record has to be out there before, you know, with its original acquisition that was created when the item was created. If you've got an upgrade or some things or a, I don't know, a construction pro project where you need to add additional acquisitions, you can do that using this acquisition import. It'll, you know, you provide the information. Like I said, I will provide a template and then you can import those additional items, um, those additional acquisitions against those existing items. Okay. I know that that was a lot, but I just really needed you guys' feedback on these new districts. I'm thinking ahead, you know, as to, you know, I know that's gonna happen soon, if not already, that you've got districts that didn't wanna migrate um, and wanna start. And how do we go about doing that with spreadsheets? That's what we're still working on and trying to accomplish that. Okay. Just a, a, a couple other things um, that I want to talk about during the session is um, you know, moving away from the imports is uh, the reports. I know that was one thing and there's really not a whole lot to cover here because it's pretty basic, but also we are tweaking reports as well. And I think more so on the options that we have available in them. And it's not so much the gap reports. I'm going to our reports documentation where we have a table of all the reports available in inventory right now and their classic counterpart. Um, and then I've got uh, links here for the re gap reports and for the non-gap reports. So for the gap reports, um, you know, you can go down to these links to go to that specific one. But when it comes to the gap reports, there's not a whole lot to select from in those. So if I go to my instance here and run the source report, yeah, you've got the include and exclude entity options and generate. We do have an issue out there for include exclude, found out that it wasn't recognizing um, if you're excluding specific entities from the report. So we do have that. Um, uh, we do have a JIRA issue for that to correct that. And that is going to be on the 1.11 release. So we're coming up to 1.10 next week. So that'll be two weeks later. Um, so that's one thing. Um, so the gap reports, not a whole lot of options, but when you get into the non-gap reports, like the brief asset listing, which is the old 304 report and classic, there's a lot of stuff going on in here. Um, and so you've got, again, the ability to enter in specific things like a specific tag number, um, whether you want capitalized, non-capitalized or both, um, the item statuses, um, do I just want active items? So you can select on those, um, sort options. And here's where, um, this needs to be I, uh, improved. I'm not sure programming wise what they can do, but um, one thing, it, not so much the sort, well, 
some of these sorts need to be improved a little bit. But the selection options, what we have right now, and this is really the 304 report because the classic report had so many different things that you can select on. Um, we incorporated them in here, but I feel like, and I want you guys' opinion on this, I feel like there needs to be drop downs of like the current item categories I can select from. It says select, not enter. So we need to probably get this fixed so that you guys can, so the end user can select the item category or the location or the asset class. I mean, because they don't know them offhand, um, especially the locations. If there's a, the ability to select or start entering in the value and it will just pop up, um, kind of like your pending file. Um, so, I, these need to be improved, and I know that they're aware of this, um, so I just don't know the your issue offhand, uh, but these are the things that we're tweaking in the reports, all of these extra select and sort options that, you know, you guys giving us feedback on that, um, and I know some of you have because we've written some to your issues already on how it may not be working or sorting properly. Um, we definitely need uh, to be made aware of those. Um, and we'll get those, you know, we'll get your issues written for those to get those fixed. Um, but yeah, I felt like the uh, refacet listing could be improved here a little bit with these um, drop downs included in here. Um, let me see. Another one probably is the book value report. You probably have quite a few options in here as well. And so again, the select. Um, I guess, yeah, items. Well, we got the item statuses, select, sort options. Yeah, so there's not really too much there. Um, but yeah, I just, you know, when you're going through these and you're running them and you find something that's just not quite right, um, and it didn't sort the way you thought it was going to sort based on what you selected, please send us a ticket and we'll look into those and see what's happening. But um, hopefully the documentation here. Um, provides, you know, just kind of uh, some good information about, you know, I know they have to learn the new terminology of the report. So um, they'll get used to it, just like we all have, just like they got used to what a 101 meant. What does a 101 mean? At least this tells them it's a fixed asset by the source fund that they're using, you know? So um, it's so just getting used to that. Um, so yeah, so all of this is available, all these reports. Um, these are probably the main ones. I know there was some kind of miscellaneous reports that we did um, where, yeah, you know, I don't really know how often those were used in our focus group was the same way. Like, yeah, you know, is there something that we absolutely have to have? And these are the ones that, you know, they came up with. But I think we have to keep in mind too, what isn't a report already can be pulled in through the grids. And, you know, and if they're wanting, you know, one thing we don't have with the reports are spreadsheet capabilities. And that's because we have those spreadsheet capabilities right now in the grids. So if there's something where they're really like, I really, really want this brief asset listing to not just be a PDF, I want to be able to have an Excel spreadsheet, we need to get the feedback. You know, and so your districts start using this and they're really wanting these spreadsheet capabilities, they need to let us know so we can start prioritizing that and creating JIRA issues for those. So, okay. So again, reports, you know, either basically I'm not gonna go through how to run one because there's not a whole lot to it. So, um, but like I said, if you feel like things need to be enhanced, let us know. Um, I know that we do have, like I said, some cheer issues out there. Uh, we've got an issue for the 304 is failing to generate when including a disposition date. So that's going to be on the 111. So that's coming up soon. Um, I already told you about the entity IDs not working um, on those gap reports. So that's going to be on 111. And we do already have an issue about the book value sorting. Um, and we're having some issues with that. So we created a JIRA issue for that. That hasn't been scheduled yet, but um, uh, that is something that we're aware of. And just, um, you know, 
one other thing I wanted to make mention, I know we covered just imports on the system. The capitalization criteria is the EIS cap. It, it's really basic, not a whole lot to it. You're just changing your amount. And if you use a life limit and it gives a projection only report um, and it displays the fiscal year to tell you what year it's um, going to make the capitalization criteria, but it works like the old EIS cap program in Classic. Um, so there's not a whole lot to that. Um, but the users, I wanted to talk just about, we are aware that we've got some uh, issues with um, giving them more access or being able to change things when they shouldn't. Um, so we have for the next release 110, uh, the group manager role in inventory, um, it's allowing for more privileges and the classic identifier did. So that needs to be changed. And it should not allow user access, um, the group manager role to users or roles. So we're um, making those changes as well. So those will all be out here on 110 next Friday. And um, also one other thing that's on that issue, I know it's kind of a side note, is pending items. I think there was um, a little bug with being able to delete them from, I think, the grid. Um, and so we're changing that as well um, in order to, you know, was a bug that was preventing that from happening. So um, that's going to be on the 111 or, or 110 release as well. And uh, implementing ADS is going to be out in the next release too. I know a lot of people have asked about that um, Active Directory. Um, so that will be out there as well in the next release. Um, that's really all I had. I mean, I know that, you know, I kind of showed you the imports, showed you where, you know, the documentation is. I will put those template spreadsheets out there. You know, I've updated the documentation to include those new options and what not to do and what not to use at this point. Um, we are you know talking about this already as a team and getting these things resolved. So once we do, obviously I will be passing that information on to you guys. Um, but you know, I, I'm hoping the, you know these last few sessions were helpful, you know, going over the actual migration imports and talking about the inventory results file. Um, we do have those out there recorded if you need to review those. And I know also we also had PowerPoints that showed screenshots of inventory warnings and stuff like that. They're also out there in our common import errors. Um, that was a few weeks ago. Um, and then a couple of weeks ago, we had training on the actual transaction menu and went through that just to get you guys a little more comfortable. And then this session was really more of a, this is what's going on with the imports right now. Um, and just wanting to get your feedback about districts starting new and how they want that stuff entered in. So I feel like I got some, some good feedback from you guys on that. So I appreciate that. If you think you need more training in inventory, please, when we set out the evaluation, let me know um, what type you're wanting, or if you feel like there's something missing in the documentation that you would like to have in there. I know a lot of you, I know some of you are pretty much done with your inventory migrations, but a lot of you haven't started yet. Um, so, you know, if there's something that you're needing, let me know, um, whether through an email, through a ticket, um, you know, through the evaluations, when we send those out, I would, you know, really appreciate, you know, what we can do to make the migrations less painful for you guys. So again, um, will EIS CD bundle be ready? I'm hoping that it'll be ready by the end of fiscal year 22. I have my fingers crossed um, that it's gonna be out there. Um, so, it, and it's going to be similar to what you're seeing with monthly CD and payroll CD. So we'll have a um, inventory bundle that they can generate. Okay, any other questions? All right, well, like I said, this recording will be out there. And again, please feel free to give us any feedback regarding you know, future topics you guys wanna to cover in inventory. 
appreciate you guys taking the time. I know I'm always running over on these things. I'm so sorry. Um, but uh, if you have any other questions, feel, feel free to email me too. Thanks, hey, Michelle. Everybody. Have a good weekend. Michelle. Michelle, yes. real quick. Yes. Has your position changed on whether or not they should be up to date when they close Classic? Um, it, you know, I, no, I think we think that they should try to get things um, as up to date, you know, try to catch up because like I, you know, what I've said before, when we were doing the import session is their pending file, you know, worried about that. You know, if they've got some really old stuff out there, they need to clean up and, and put on there um, and get those items on there now and classic um, would be great. Um, if not, you know, like, like we said, the pending file does not get migrated over. So, um, you know, once they migrate on, they're going to have to use that pull from USAS option to pull that information in from their USSR instance to recreate their pending file. So, it, you know, it just really depends on where they're at, you know, but if they're pretty far behind, they should get caught up. I mean, if, if we're talking like a couple of years, yeah, I, I would think that they should get caught up, but um, it's, it's, I know it's just a hard decision without seeing everybody's inventory and where they're at. Okay, thanks. So, okay, yeah, so that's kind of, I answered your question, uh, Lori, all right. So yeah, I mean, if they don't want to, to uh, they're still like in, in 20 and they're not gonna clean up, um, that's fine. I mean, they, they can migrate over, um, then they'll be closing out. Um, but, you know, we don't have EISCD in place and stuff like that. So I really feel like, you know, if they wanna get all of that information and in the reports up to, to current, then they probably should be doing all of that in classic. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good weekend.